In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is called We Say No. We Say No. Brother Steve would have heard this sermon this week and both of us were really blessed by it and I thought I'd, from my notes, I'd just touch on this sermon that we heard this week. As I said, we had great 12 sermons, um, all different um, and we were richly blessed by it. But this one probably struck out the most to me, or stuck out the most, I should say. But we say no. John 21 verse 22 says, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And notice these words, follow thou me. Follow thou me. And just in context, he will read between now, we'll just go back a bit to verse 15. After Jesus had spoken these things, these things transpired before. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved at this point. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And this is quite a a potent part in Scripture because Peter, I think, straight away knew why the Lord said this three times. And I think as we know, Um, It was because he denied Christ three times. Jesus was making a point. And in a way, we kind of think now that maybe Peter was thinking because he was grieved, he was worried that the other disciples were going to find out. They were going to find out that Peter actually denied Christ. Up until this point, I don't believe they knew. They don't believe they knew. Or he, they knew. I don't believe he would have told them. Well, we're not told in Scripture that they knew that he denied them. So Peter was probably thinking to himself, Lord, don't tell them, don't tell them, I am ashamed. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Because remember when the third time in that cock crew, Jesus looked straight into the eyes of Peter. And that would have cut Peter to heart. And he knew that he had said no to the Lord. An interesting point of scripture. And also it was pointed out that Peter was also back fishing in this chip chapter. We see you go back to verse 3. It says, Simon Peter saith unto them, uh, the other seven, or the other disciples, I think there were seven there at that stage, I go a fishing. So he, after, after all that had transpired, he decided to go back to his career or just wanted to do a spot of fishing perhaps. And he says, I go fishing. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, that's what the Lord was saying, lovest thou more uh, Lovest thou me more than these? Maybe it was his career of fishing. Maybe it was the fish. It could have been the disciples. That's what I've got written down here in my side notes. Do you love me more than they love me? That could have been the case because the other disciples love Jesus. But do you love me more than your career? Do you love me more than these fish? And indeed today, we can love our careers. We can love our jobs a little bit too much. A little bit too much. And we can say no to Jesus. We can say no to him. So inside of him, he was just playing, please don't tell them. Please don't tell them. I don't want them to know what my inner self is like. We do say no to Jesus. So how many of us at this point in time don't want the Lord to spill the beans on any one of us of our sins or something that we've done in the past or are doing or doing right now? Lord, don't tell them. Don't let people know because we would be ashamed, possibly ashamed at what we're doing. You know, we plan our lives ahead of ourselves at, at times with little or any regard for what, for what Christ wants for us. Well, I do. You, know, you plan your life, you plan your day, I'm going to do this job first and do that job and that job and then something happens in here. <laughs> And then it sort of froze the day out. 
by the time three o'clock comes, I'm ready for a sleep, I'm ready to, <laughs> especially if you've been up since five or six, and all right. Um, you plan your day, but there's always something that goes in there and then messes that day up a little. But we tend for our lives, we make plans. Yes, I'll, I'll finish school, I'll go to university, I'll get this job and I'll raise a family. And yet there may be in that time a call from God to serve him. And yet we can say no to God. We put our careers, our own lives in front of what God wants for us. What God wants for us. Let me read verses 20 and 22. Then Peter turning about, see if the disciple, which is John, whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So that was John. Verse 21, and Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? See, Peter at this stage was still having a bit of an inner conflict and turmoil in his soul. He was more worried about what the Apostle John should do and shouldn't do. And some of us at times are like that. You know, that person shouldn't be doing this and doing that when we've still got a beam in our own eye. Um, and that can happen. But he was more worried about what John was doing instead of what Jesus told him to do. Because of the baton, because Jesus was the first pastor, the first shepherd of the first church of which he started. And he handed to the baton to Peter at this stage. So Peter became the next pastor. And we see that in Acts 1.16, where Peter stood up in front of the assembly, the congregation. There were 120 people there. So by the time we get to the book of Acts, there was 120 members in that church. And Peter was the first pastor. But what did Christ say to Peter? Follow thou me. And it's something that each and every one of us need to take stock of at least once a week. Are we really following Christ? Or are we saying no? You know, in Genesis, we see the creation account and how that Christ created everything. How Christ created everything. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 to 17 says this. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. If Jesus was somehow to not exist, we wouldn't exist either. Our molecules would just fly apart because he holds all things together and all things consist because of him. Such is the power that Jesus Christ, our creator, holds. And we see this also in Mark chapter 4. So if we just turn there now, please. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. So we see that Christ created all things. All things are under his control. Nothing consists except for his existence. Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41 says these words. And this is the, the stilling of the tempters when they were in the, in, the, in the boats, in the ship. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and, look at this, he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? It doesn't say little faith, it says no faith. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even in the wind and the sea obey him? 
So we see here from just from this scripture that all of creation obeys his command without question. Okay, all of his creation obeyed the Lord's command without question. We also see this with the prophet Jonah. You remember how that he blessed Nineveh and he went around and he preached and many Ninevites came and got saved, turned their lives around. He wasn't happy with that. So he goes and sits and the Lord commanded a gourd to grow over him in a day and it shaded him. Jesus has command over all these things. Oh, you've got to think about when he turned the water into wine. All the Lord did was take pure water and turn it into grape juice without the sun, the earth and the growing of the vine and everything else. He just skipped all those bits and turned it into grape juice, the mustum, that which is best when it's called wine. Before it turns and starts to ferment, it's the best wine. It's the must or the mustum. So Jesus just filled that bit in the middle. And why can't he? He created all things. All things consist, even you and I, because of him. My goodness, we need to be thankful every day when we wake up vertical and we can walk around, we can touch, we can think, we can pray, we can be a blessing to people, all because of Christ. All because of Christ. Then there's the account of the prophet Elijah. Remember in 1 Kings uh, 17 to verses 4 to 6, God commanded the ravens to feed him. So the fowls of the air were created by Christ. So it's nothing for him to command a raven to go find a piece of bread and bring it to Elijah to eat. The word of God says, So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. So he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. God commanded this, and it was so. It happened. He created these birds, this bird, and it happened. Our sovereign God is in control. And it was the same with the, uh, the widow woman that he went to, to meet. Remember the story how she was going to die? She was, had to bake this bread and a couple of sticks first to bake the bread and whatever else I believe that's the case um, and she was going to die and the Lord said well that's all right but first bake me some bread bake me a couple of cakes God had commanded this woman to do so God had commanded this woman to do so 1 Kings 17 12 it says <clears throat> excuse me um, it should be verse 9 1 Kings 17 9 Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. I think that's amazing. I commanded. Has there been times in your life when you've seen the, the hand of God working in other people? To bring about a certain situation for his benefit. You and I think that Sometimes situations, especially difficult situations that you can come against, God should, we, should happen this way. A, B, C, D, E and F, and that's the way it should happen. But instead, F starts off, <laughs> and then it goes backwards and mumbles them up, or jumbles them up. Case in point, when Brother Dan and I were over in Ghana three weeks ago, we did this um, sort of like a revival um, evangelistic night at a place called Teacher Mante. So we'd... We'd hired what they call the hall, which is pretty much just like a building and open air, but it's got a stage and everything, electricity, etc., etc., And everything was planned. You know, we, we were going to show first the passion of Christ, just probably the first half hour. Um, and then we were going to preach each, and then we were going to have the call and then sign up people who would like to see a church started. Well, relying on this, we had the computer, everything there was delivered. <laughs> when we got there, but the young man with the USB tube with the movie on it was stuck in traffic <laughs> for five hours. Yes, <laughs> for five hours. And Dan's, <laughs> could be, <laughs> this is an Accra. The roads there are incredible, like they're doing the roads up and they're rough. I mean, they're rough. 
Um, and when we've got these big bollards up because they're fixing them up, so when a truck breaks down, and they do with um, regular, um, on a regular timetable, they just stop, um, you've got to go around them. And so it slows everything down. Anyway, we were supposed to start at six. By about seven, we're thinking, okay. <laughs> then and, and, um, a Brody starts doing the song and dance item. Um, <laughs> well, he wasn't dancing. He was singing in his African voice, and it was lovely to hear, and everybody was enjoying it, those that were seated who came. And then we were looking at the time, I think it was 7.30, getting, uh, okay. Then Dan gets up to preach, so he preaches, and 8 o'clock comes around when we should finish. Mind you, it's supposed to start at six, but here it is, eight o'clock, time to go home, and guess what rolls in? The young man with the USB stick. <laughs> Dan looks at me because he's getting quite exasperated, and <laughs> it's, it's all right, Dan, just, <laughs> just the Lord's in control. Anyway, so after 15 minutes, they finally got it working, and we all watched it, probably for three quarters of an hour, it was a very late night, but most people stayed. Most people stayed, and then we gave the, you know, the call at the end and everything else, and, and people put their names forward to start a church. But you see, we thought, well, it's best to do it this way. The Lord said, no, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to do it this way, <laughs> in reverse. And all you've got to say is yes to the Lord and not no. But sometimes we say no. It can't work this way. Let's pull the pin and go home. No. <laughs> when it's God's way. So I've seen it firsthand. God in action and it's wonderful to watch i just smile about it when i think about it yes he's in control so that's what we can do sometimes you know we can get ahead of ourselves but yes that poor woman you know she thought well they're going to die they're going to bake the cake and then elijah comes in says no bake the cakes for me first and then for yourself and then they never ran out of the oil or the meal they were fed they were fed but God commanded, and it was so. It was so. Now let's go to Luke chapter 5, please. We've got plenty of time. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verses 4 to 5. And I'm sure you're aware of this, of this account in Scripture. Luke 5, 4 to 5. I'll just read from verse 1 to just to, to paint the picture. It's Christ teaches from Peter's ship. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, isn't that amazing? He stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their, look at this word, nets. Okay, nets, plural. There's more than one. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I don't agree with you, but at thy word, I will let down the net. Singular. Singular. Notice those words. Peter said, yeah, sure, we're going to catch a lot of fish. I'll just let one out. But look what happens when he did let that one out. When they had, done, had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners that were in the other ship and, and that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. So it's amazing, even though Peter... Peter here really said no. He only put in one net. Jesus said put in the nets. Sometimes we only put in one net. We just give things a half-hearted go. We don't really do what Jesus said. So in effect, we say no. I, I think that's an interesting account here. But yet, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying... Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. So he felt and he understood that his unbelief, that he had not obeyed the voice of the Lord's command and it caught him out. His unbelief in submitting wholeheartedly to Christ. He got it at this point, but fell later onto by denying Christ. 
And this is the part here where I want to make this statement, which was made the other day down at, um, or up, up at West Wyong. You see, we are the only part of God's creation. We are the only part of God's creation that says no to God. The seas don't say no to God. The ravens don't say no to God. The fish don't say no to God. But we say no to God. We say no to God. In many aspects of our lives, we can say no to God. You know, we may say no to church-led discipleship and Bible study. And there's many reasons why people can't come, and I understand that. But when we can, we should. But we say no. Are we putting ourselves first in life? I know I do at times. We say no to regular Bible study. <laughs> I can do that at times. I've got to make sure I'm in the Bible. Otherwise, I can get caught out by Satan and his snares. Got to be in the Word of God. We can say no to a, a regular prayer life. And I struggle with this too when you get so busy. But you've got to find time. My, my best time, as I said, it's before. It's in the morning when I get up early before I go to work. And the day's griefs come on me. <laughs> all the trials and tribulations that we have when we work. We all know that. We've all been there. But we say no when we don't pray. When he says to pray fervently. We say no to that. We are the only part of God's creation that says no. Maybe we say no to witnessing to people. You know, you get that, that urge or, or the Lord speaks to you and says, go to that person and just give a hand track. And we say, no. I told you last week I was pulled up by a female policeman at a, at a booze bus. I, I'm glad they do that you know, for us. I do. I, I think it's safe <laughs> that they're out there at least trying. So I thought, ah, captive audience. Would you like to read this? <laughs> and so she took it and said, yeah, I can read that. <laughs> and that's all it's got to do. And that's all you've got to do. We've got our little happy, smiley face um, thank you cards. You know, hand them out to the next time a policeman pulls you up. And see what the response is. <laughs> thank you for your service. Right. <laughs> Depends what... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's probably a very good point. <laughs> Maybe don't do it. But... <laughs> But this is the thing, you know, when the Lord says to do something, don't say no. There's a reason for that season. Um, you know, we say no to Jesus because we plain just don't trust him like Peter as we should. And that's the submissive part on our part. We need to submit. Submit to trusting him. Submit to trusting him. But you might say, well, hang on, I do trust him. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Just like that story I gave of account with Dan and I in Ghana. Have you given birth to kittens because things weren't going the way you had planned? And yes, I have. <laughs> you start getting worried. You start the fret. And you start, yeah, yeah, you're just not trusting God. Normally after five minutes, I realise what I'm doing. Okay, <laughs> you're teaching me something here, Lord, I get it. And then you submit. And you let what happens, happens, and let him take up the slack. He's got an answer for it. Like, what's going to happen to you tomorrow, he already knows about. So why in juice do we worry about it? Why worry about tomorrow? We don't know what's there. What's that verse say again? Tomorrow will worry about the things of itself. That's correct. But yet we worry. You know, I prayed last night about a certain thing that was going to happen and immediately the Lord took it away from me. That stress, that worry, like that. And then you think, start thinking about it during the night, but that worry, that, that, you know, that deadness, that fright inside you, you think you're going to die, it's, it went. I just asked, ask and ye shall receive. Because it's not in his will for you to suffer and worry about tomorrow. He's already got it in his hand. This is an amazing thing about God and his sovereignty. And even that word which is above his sovereignty, he's the almighty. He's the I am. This is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. So there is an acronym in kind of finishing. And it goes with the word mankind. Mankind. So M stands for 
me. Now, we are the only ones in God's creation that says no. And I think it's all about me. And I think we could all say that. It's all about me, this life, my career, my jobs, my house I want to buy, the cars, the bikes, whatever else you want in life, it's just all about me. And we've got to admit, we can be selfish, and it's part of our fallen nature. But we are a new creation in Jesus Christ, and that's what we need to feed. Then there's the letter A, autonomous. Autonomous means self-government. We like to be in control of all things. We like to govern our own lives, our own lives. When I was listening to this sermon, I'm thinking, yes, you are dead right. We do. I do. And that's why it's good to get away to these fellowship meetings at least once a year because we need to be fed. Pastors need to be fed. We do. We need your prayers and we need to be fed. We need to be fed the word of God. And we need to be convicted as well. Autonomous, self-government. The third letter is N. The word no. We say no because we can. Because we can. The Lord has allowed us as part of his creation that you and I have the ability to say no. We can say yes to the Lord and submit, or we can say no to the Lord and we don't submit. We don't submit. Then there's K. Remember this is Ackerman's Mankind. King. K is for king. We want to rule our own lives our way. We want to be king. We, we want to be the sovereign of our own lives. And I understand this. But one of the reasons for this sermon the other day was because men and women get called into the ministry and just say no. He came up with these figures that 95%, this is in America, 95% of all pastors preach to only 5% of the population. That puts it in perspective. 95% of all preachers in the States only speak to 5% of the population. There is a need. There is a need for more men, young and old. I got the call when I was, when I was 50. <laughs> I thought I'd missed it all. <laughs> he wouldn't leave me alone. And there was a reason for that. There was a very good reason for that. A novice shouldn't be taken the pulpit. Sometimes you've got to have the more mature age person to take it. Now, I had a lot of growing up to do from my youth up till then. <laughs> I think I still am, if you ask Julie. And that's, <laughs> and that's a fair comment. <laughs> but, you know, we want to do it our way. And there's not enough, there's not enough people surrendering to the ministry. In Ghana, now there's another church, and I didn't read out. I'll I'll just grab it. I'll just grab it. I didn't read it out before. Um, This is the names of the second church that's going to be planted similar time next year, next August. And there's 23 people that were baptised when we were over there. Um, That's a lot of people. 28 people were were baptised, they professed their salvation in Christ and they do have a pastor, he's an older man like myself and and another guy whom whom I baptised, an ex-Pentecostal and he was was on fire for the Lord. Like, I mean, they're really on fire, They they want to know what the truth says, what the Bible says. It's almost as if we're going over there with a mop bucket trying to clean up the MCG after a footy match, that's what it feels like. Um, there's so much doctrine over there that people are, they're not being fed and they're confused. They're confused. And when you get into the doctrine of the Word of God in the King James Bible, you see what the Word of God is and then you are at peace within yourself. Because if you don't know, if you have doubts about something, whether it's a verse or, or, or something that's controversial, you know, Brony often, when we often talk, he says, oh, We'll read a verse. Oh, that's controversial over here. Oh, is it? So we talk through it. And, um, and he enlightens me to some of the way of the thinking that the Ghanaians have. But we need preachers. We need even missionaries over there to help. Like So when we're teaching him now, I'm just starting to unload some of the burden off onto Brother John. 
the last six to eight months, I've been teaching a brony five days a week, one to two hours late afternoon. That's his early morning. <laughs> okay, it's normally five to seven in the morning for him. It's three to five in the in the afternoon for us. So I've been teaching him. So now, so because we don't have anyone over there who can teach the word of God, so we're doing it by the only way we can through Messenger or Zoom, and it's working. He's only got two subjects left to go and he's completed the whole doctrinal booklet. He's on fire. Last week he led two people to Christ. The week before, another one or two people he led to Christ. And I heard him in action. You know, when, you, when you jump in a Uber or a Bolt taxi, um, you've got a captive audience. <laughs> and I was able to witness firsthand how he witnesses to people. By the way, can I ask you a question, he goes. If you were to die tonight, where would you go? And then the conversation would start. It was really good. It was really good. He never let a chance go by. He never let a chance go by. The next letter is I in mankind, independence. We want to be free from outside control and not subject to another's authority. God's given us this free will, and it is a free will. It is a free will. And we are free to choose. And that works in sync with God's sovereignty. He doesn't choose people to be saved or people to go to hell. No. No, it works in unison, okay, and it locks together. The sovereignty of God and the free will of man both exist. And it exists and, and forms this beautiful new creation when you're saved. You see, you're a new creature. A new creature. And then you start to develop. Cells start multiplying and before long you're a mature Christian a new creature in, we are, we are a new creature we're new creatures in Christ the second last one is N nevertheless, nevertheless we despise the way and do it our own way we don't heed the, the master's call he says follow thou me now whether it's following the Lord into the ministry to be a pastor or a missionary or, or somebody that handles the Facebook accounts of church, or somebody that handles the, the, um, the treasury at church, or someone that handles the, the, the emails for our, our missionaries. You know, you can be called into that. Even to be called into learning more doctrine, to help me out even. I don't mind that. If you want to learn, I can teach. We've got all the books here. But really... Our, our internet, really, just, I've got it about that high. <laughs> all the books we've got. And the Bible. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Because it's all built on this. I can teach. Just need willing ears to join in this, this great crusade in winning the loss for Christ. He's got a plan for each and every one of us. And you can fit into that plan. The final uh, letter is D for destiny. We want to control our own destiny. Remembering again that we are the only creation that says, or the only part of creation that says no to God. Everything else doesn't. And he's right when the Lord said, I could make these, these rocks into the children of Abraham. And they could cry out. He could do that. He could do that. Because he made them. It's like our eyes. He, he can see through our eyes whatever we're looking at. Whatever we're looking at, whatever we're watching on the idiot box, he sees through our eyes. Why? He made them. It's not hard, or, nor should it be incredulous, that the Lord can see what we're looking at through our eyes. Through everyone, at any point of time, at any second on planet Earth. And you think, how does he do that? I find it hard to understand God. How almighty is he? I, that's where it just floors me at times. How almighty is he? My goodness. But that's what, we, that's what man does. And just in finishing, if any of these things, and there are more, there are more, applies to you, then join the club. But we can also join the other club like Peter did in Luke 5, 11 where it says, and when they had brought their ships to land, look at these words, they forsook all, they forsook the world, he forsook his wonderful career, and he loved his fish, he loved his fishermen, 
and followed Christ. Brethren, that's where we need to be today. Forsaking the world and following Christ. He gave up his life to follow Christ. Can any one of us here today say that? Even if it's just handing out hand tracks, we've got plenty there, please. Let's hand them all out so we've got to buy more. That is a good problem to have. The more you hand out, the more people that get reached for Christ. It's even got all the spots on that pull-up banner there where you can leave them. Where you can leave them. In a policeman's hand. In a lavatory. At an ATM. Um, yes, seats. Seats. The National Bank is so nice, they put their ATMs under the roof now so they won't get wet. <laughs> Two can play their game. <laughs> so, you've got a captive audience. We really have. And, uh, and that's not confrontational. It really isn't. It's just leaving them around somewhere. Park benches um, on a fine day, wherever you can. If the Lord lays it on your heart to leave it somewhere, leave it somewhere. Don't say no. Because what does he say in John for our springboard text? John 21, 22. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come. What is that to you? What is that to thee, sorry? Follow thou me. Will you follow Christ? Will you follow Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we just thank you for your words this morning.